other. seeing that we changed the clocks last night and if you didn't it's maybe you should do that and the other thing that uh, we look forward to this morning is that we're going to have our AGM at 11 o'clock one other thought has occurred to me that uh, some of you may wonder why we always begin our worship services with the confession and absolution and the sheer simple fact is that we cannot come before God as sinners. We need to be cleansed and free of our sin. And that's what we do. That's how we start our service so that we confess our sins. He cleanses us. And now we're free to enter into his presence and worship him and glorify him and thank him and all the good things that happen when we meet with God in person. So we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all of our sins. And as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Men of faith, rise up and sing of a great
Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of all mercy, by your power to heal and to forgive, graciously cleanse us from all sin and make us strong through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is from Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Here ends the first reading. Our psalm is Psalm 10. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Today's epistle lesson is taken from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For the grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Here ends the second reading. The Holy Gospel is found recorded in the Gospel of John, the third chapter, beginning reading at the 14th verse. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God and this is the judgment the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Hello, everybody. It is such a pleasure for me to be here with you all once again. Spring is right at our doorstep, and I am loving all the sunshine that we are getting. Our Gospel for today is a very special one. There are many important verses in the Bible, but... The one that we will read together in just a moment here um, is probably one of my personal all-time favorites. So follow along with the words down below. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John three sixteen. If there was one Bible verse that you should always carry with you throughout your entire life, I personally think that this one would be it. I remember, you know, growing up, going to Sunday school, and this Bible verse, this one, was one that my teachers had us memorize all the time. And even from a super, super young age, I could recite it pretty easily. <laughs> Our upcoming season of spring... It's one that brings so much light into our lives and it feels so nice to feel the warm sun and breathe in the fresh air and we can look forward to seeing the snow and the ice melt and we can, you know, be excited for the grass to turn green, the trees to grow leaves and uh, so many flowers um, for them to bloom. In our gospel reading for today, we're learning the importance of Jesus and the light that he brings to all the children of God. Jesus is the light that leads us from the darkness of, of sin, and he is sent by God to save us. Now, allow me to read this important part of the gospel reading for you all. It goes like this. People loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Okay. Um, as humans, we all make decisions every day. 
some better than others, some worse than others. And here we are being reminded that it is in our nature to hide away from Jesus and from God. We, you know, don't want to show our mistakes and all the bad things that we do and what we say and we want to hide them all in the dark. Jesus is such a bright and powerful light that there is no way that we can hide all these negative things um, and thoughts from him. We are called to make a decision. Stay in the dark and grovel in our sin or come to the light. Oh. We are called to make a decision. We can either stay in the dark and grovel in our sin or come into the light of Jesus Christ and be saved and forgiven. Spring is a time for clearing. And that's what, um, you know, the same. Oh. Spring is a time for cleaning. That's why the saying spring cleaning is so popular. There's a reason why Lent takes place in the springtime when we are in this you know, time of transition from the cold and dark winter to the bright and warm summer. And as we approach closer to Easter, I pray that you will come to the light of Jesus and feel his love and forgiveness. It may feel hard to own up to our mistakes and our sins, but you know what? In this very same gospel reading, uh, we are reassured and reminded of God's intention. And it says here, For God did not send his Son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 3.17 Jesus was sent to help us grow closer to God, and we cannot truly be saved without him. Sometimes it might feel a little overwhelming to try and be the quote-unquote perfect Christian. And as you continue to grow in your journey with God, keep, you know, this entire gospel reading in your heart. Memorize a verse or two and keep it close. And remind yourself that as long as you have the light of Jesus in your life, you will be forgiven. Let us pray. So repeat after me and fold our hands and close our eyes. Dear Lord, Thank you for the wonderful weather. Thank you for bringing the sun to warm us. Thank you for the light of Jesus Christ. Please help us to stay in the light so that we will grow closer to you every day. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. And thank you very much for listening, and I will see you guys next time. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever attended one of those mystery dinner theaters? That is where everyone is given a set of clues and you have to try and solve the mystery. Nicodemus finds himself in that kind of a situation. He was a member of the Jewish court called the Sanhedrin. Uh, that is the court that ultimately sat in judgment of Jesus. It was a 72-member legal body, which was the Supreme Court of the land. 
Now, Nicodemus was a member of that august body. Most of the members belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Most of them managed to get a mad on uh, for Jesus because he was drawing a lot of attention to himself and, uh, and away from them. However, Nick seems to have been one of the exceptions rather than the rule. He seems to have had a conscience, an honest seeker of the truth. The mystery for him was, who was this Jesus? I mean, really. He had heard about Jesus' revolutionary teachings, teachings that were not those of a learned man, teachings that didn't quote the great rabbis of Israel. They were teachings that were authentic, original. They had that sound of verity to them. Now here was a teacher who thought taught with authority, and his teachings had that clear ring of truth to them. And there were those stories about the miracles that Jesus supposedly performed, stories that cascaded like a never-ending stream from a host of sources. Everybody was talking about him, of course. So what was Nicodemus supposed to believe? After all, Israel, after all, was looking for the Messiah. They've been looking at him for him for a long time, and something about the tingle in the air seemed like it was imminent. We sort of get that picture. So could this Jesus be the one they were looking for? Every thing pointed to what you would call an exceptional person, but so many, many questions. I can see myself in his boots, wondering, searching, really curious, but more than curious, this was a big deal. So Nicodemus did what any self-respecting person in a highly respected position uh, concerning, concerned about his reputation might do. <laughs> Uh, he went to Jesus under the cover of night. <laughs> he wanted to know who Jesus was and what his kingdom was like, and he wanted it firsthand. By the way, which happens to be a, a good move, don't you think? Uh, get right to the source if you want to know the truth. Get the story straight from the originator of that story. Now Jesus tells him that the nature of his kingdom was so radical, so different from what, from the sinful humanity that nothing other than a new birth could bring it about. Absolutely a new thing, don't you think? Something that would kind of put the brakes on and, and uh, get your mind into full gear. To become a part of that kingdom of God requires a totally new citizenship. That's how big it is. It means leaving your country, your kindred, and your father's house and going to a land that I will show you. Those are the words that God spoke to Abraham way back when. It was one of those words that God used to send Abraham to a new country, away from the idol worship that he knew, to a land where God and only God would be his stay and guide. When you strip yourself from, all, from, your, from what you know, from the territory you know, from the people you know, and the country you know, and the rules you know, you find out that you could be standing alone, don't you think? And that's where God put Abraham, totally and solely dependent upon him, period. 
And so, too, we need to change our citizenship from a world where Satan is in charge to a kingdom that has a different lifestyle completely and totally, run by different rules, run by a different Lord. You see, this transformation cannot be made through normal physical means. It is possible only through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the vehicle of baptism. Baptism is more radical than most people really realize and really don't seem to get their mind around it. And neither could my Nicodemus get his mind uh, into the midst of, uh, into a mindset such that it, he could see that what is physical remains physical and that which is spiritual therefore has to have a spiritual origin. This means that spiritual life can only be imparted from a spiritual source. It has to come from God himself. But Nicodemus isn't the only one who had trouble with this. We have trouble getting past the Ten Commandments or works righteousness. That is, we still have the notion that we can get our way into heaven if we work hard enough and if we're the good guy. And that simply translates into not being so bad that we don't have to go to jail. We have trouble acknowledging that sin really is a capital offense and not a minor misdemeanor. Whenever we take this view, we are not reckoning with sin unbelief, rebellion, lawlessness, our real nature that is rotten to the core. Unless this sin and this sinful nature is taken into account and taken care of, we stand in judgment before God who demands that we be sinless. Now, Jesus comes into our world and tells us that only he can reveal God to us. He's the only one who knows God personally and intimately. And that the heart of God can only be revealed through the cross. Now here he comes and tells them about being lifted, uh, the brass serpent being lifted on the pole and so forth. And that had, goes back to when Israel was in the wilderness and uh, being disobedient as they usually were, God punishes them. And one of the punishments that he sends upon them is uh, venomous snakes. And people got bit and they died. And so... Uh, uh, when they finally repented again and asked God for help, then he told Moses to make a brass serpent and just put it up on a pole. Uh, and everyone who was bitten by a snake and in the process of dying, if he looked upon that pole, believing what God had said, that he would, uh, that they wouldn't die if they believed, they wouldn't die. In the same way, and then Jesus uses that as the illustration, it was uh, life is given to those who look up with the eyes of faith upon the Son of Man who's hanging from a cross. Now, we need to recognize that looking upon a brass serpent hanging on the pole is not your standard cure for snake bite. It wasn't the brass serpent, you see, that saved people from physical death. But their faith in the promise that God made to the Israelite people, and if they followed his instructions in faith, that he would keep them from dying from their snake bite. Now, in the same fashion, 
those who looked upon the crucified Savior of the world, believing that through him there is forgiveness of sin and therefore no condemnation. But let's not miss that there's a big difference here, and that is that Jesus' death really does pay the penalty for our sin, and in so doing opens the door to, recul to reconciliation with God. It is the voice of a crucified man dying in agony, you see, that has convinced millions that God is indeed a God of immense love. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you can really wrap your mind about what is happening there and, and what he is saying in those words and, and, and the immense love that allows him to pray for those who put him there, you get to be start to understand the vastness of God's love, that it has no outward dimensions, no restrictions. Jesus said, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. On the cross, God takes the condemnation of sin upon himself and there makes payment for our sin in our place, period. This is a new gift of life. It's simply a gift handed to us, bought and paid for. Why is it so hard to understand? And why is it so hard to accept? Bought and paid for. Free doesn't mean it's cheap. It has an awesome price attached to it. The very agony and death of Jesus on the cross. And all we have to do is accept it. It is the love of God in action. When we receive Jesus into our life, our life changes. Even though we remain on this earth and have the limitations of being attached to this earth and all that that means, we know that life has taken a, on a totally different quality because Jesus now rules our life from the inside. That's what he means when he says that he will, God had said when he promised that he will, uh, uh, we don't have to be taught the law. We will know the law through the Spirit. In the fullness of time, what it means to be Christ's child will widen into the fullness of glory that we cannot yet comprehend. To put on Christ is to learn from him to love and to live life after his fashion. And that can keep on growing until we cross the bar and, and, and get, get it an ultimate total, the totality of life without restrictions in his kingdom when we meet him face to face. When we look upon the Jesus hanging on the cross, we begin to get a, a vision of how noble a human life can be. After all, that's flesh and blood. That's my brother and yours. And we begin to see what, that um, much of what we fuss about in this world is nothing but trivialities that but things that really don't matter in the eternal scheme of things. That's why I've said many times, make all your decisions in, in the light of eternity. Because that's where the real value is. 
Keep looking at him and you will receive a power from him that will enable you to rise to a newness of life, to live your life his way, imperfect at first, but you will grow more and more till, as John says, the world passes away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Isn't that beautiful? First John chapter 2. God's will for us is this kind of life uh, that it should be ours. God's love is so high and wide and deep that he just can't give us up. That's why he go. He leaves everything behind, his glory, and he sets it aside and, and takes on the form of a creature like you and me so that he can ultimately pay the price and that we can ultimately belong to him. Wow. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That says it all, I think. Such is the gracious purpose of God toward his unruly world and toward every one of us without exception. But if that love of God is to work in us, it must be met by a response from our side. We, ha we have to react to it. And we will, one way or the other. There is no in between. God so loved the world that he sent his son for everyone, but it is only those who want him and his kingdom that will not perish, but have everlasting life. I just heard someone say quite, was quite a, it, it, a message that I picked up. That's one thing that Christ couldn't pay for. And that is when we de choose, decide not to love him, not to accept him. He called it the unforgivable sin. Christ paid the price. He did it all, bought and paid for, and it's free. But if we reject him, that's on us. How much more clearly can we put the necessity for belief? Our Lord was once asked, what shall we do that we might work, might work the works of God? And the answer came, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's it. Jesus wants nothing, yet he wants everything. Give up your pride, your self-seeking, your greed, your self-importance. It has no worth or value. And accept God's love for you that cost him so very, very much. His love makes you of immeasurable worth and value. Don't you see that? Because he loves you. There's no price tag on you. Big enough. God, through his Son, gives you what you cannot acquire on your own. God's gift is for you. It has extreme value and it endures forever. What more can you want? Amen.
us uh, declare our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance to the, with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Growing in the soil of the Spirit, let us pray for the Church, the world, and all who seek the richness of life in God. Triune God, the fullness of your identity is a mystery. And yet, you reveal to the Church your awesome presence. Teach us to worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Be with all who care for the environment and make it sensitive in the ways in which we can preserve our natural resources for the good of all. Draw near to those whose bodies know pain and illness. Assure them of your living presence with them and grant them healing. Help fathers to provide for the families in their care that their service might be a sign of your heavenly love for us all. Guide the work of parish worship and music leaders and the ministry of all among us who point to your beauty and assist us as we worship you. Holy are you, O God. You have made us your holy people. Keep us uni unified with the faithful who have gone before us and who now make their home with you. Hear us as we pray, living God, and nourish us always with your word and sacrament wherever possible for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.